I like to start on time. We usually run about an hour, by the way, or try to. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, this week, I'm going to be talking on the pandemic. And so in the past, we've had other presentations on the pandemic. I mean, nobody knew it was going to last for three years, huh? Um, but it's still around. Um, so the title of COVID-19 pandemic postmortem is a little early, perhaps. I'll tell you about that. But we first, uh, we had a presentation um, just a month or less than a month, a couple of weeks after it was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization back in 2020. And then as it looked like it, and that was when there was only 1 million cases reported worldwide. Uh, that's way <laughs> off um, from what we have now. And then uh, we had a couple more as it looked like we were we we're going into year two, and there were a lot more cases and a lot of deaths. Uh, so we had one on uh, how it impacted humans, and then also on the virus itself, and then a fireside chat. And then Dr. Hendricks and I um, both created this one and reviewed, and I'm presenting it. So let's take a look. I've got, by the way, this is really, really crammed with a lot of uh, information. Oh, novel new, really? No, let's see. Let's see. No, I gave a presentation. Yes, yes, okay. Exactly. COVID. Oh. Um, okay. Lots going on. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, first of all, I'm not trying to be um, flippant by saying postmortem because, like I said, the pandemic's not over. Uh, in between mid-January, mid-February, there are 4 million new cases, 28,000 deaths monthly. And uh, the reason you might not see it in the news much anymore is because some people still think it's kind of old news. There's fewer deaths now than there was. And, sometime, and some people are fatigued over three years of hearing about the pandemic. But during the time that it was going strong, uh, particularly in January when we did uh, presentations, there were 100,000 COVID deaths weekly, which actually made it the uh, third highest um, cause of death in the world and the first in the United States where I am. So it was definitely not a trivial thing. Okay, good. I'm just checking. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look. Okay, this is what I'm going to present today. Like I said, th by the way, this is absolutely crammed full of information. Um, no, well, okay, so no, those are from, those are reported. Okay, in other words, that's the data they had to use. That was the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine um, page that still has it, except that they took in other words, they're not actively doing it anymore. Let me get the, um, the, they're not actively getting the information because they've been doing it for um, three years now. Let me get it for you. Okay, so they've been doing it for three years now. You can find it here. It's just they've uh, taken it, uh, they're no longer reporting the information, but all of the information is still there. So you can go, that's where I got the information I had for uh, today. They, they uh, stopped reporting on the 10th of March. Um, well, that's interesting, Baradon. I don't know. It depends on, of course, if you're talking Medicare, you're probably talking about the United States. Uh, but it certainly did impact, uh, we're still feeling the reverberations um, all over the world. Well, and that's another excellent question because I'm going to be going over the data. And so uh, you can only, in other words, okay, for science, you can only look at the data. But obviously, well, absolutely. And so uh, you can only look at the data that you have. But then, of course, collecting data is a whole science in itself. And so it's kind of like 
data or, or uh, garbage in, garbage out. In other words, um, does the does the data that you have really reflect the situation or not? And I'll be actually talking about that. So let's take a look at what I'm going to talk about. We're going to first take a look at diseases and how they spread. I'm not a. I talked to Dr. Hendricks about this to make sure it, it was correct. Uh, let's we'll take a look at past pandemics and how this one compares. We'll take a look at the. Um, a graphical view of the pandemic timeline, and then take a look at variants, and then uh, quite a bit on the pandemic uh, behavior. Yes, uh, and actually, I kind of did a little bit of my own. This presentation, I actually spent more time on this presentation than almost any other presentation I've done, because the more I got into it, the more fascinating it became, both from a data and an analyst side and statistical side and human side and everything. Um, well, and that's, uh, yeah, and so tagline just, that's Dr. Hendricks there, a tagline just put in something that's kind of alarming is if we, if we end up with, in other words, deleterious, if we end up with something like the Black Plague, we're going to be in real trouble. Because uh, it's just going to take out uh, a few billion people, and we'll be in. Um, that will change uh, history. I mean, it took a couple hundred years to get back to so-called normal after the original um, Black Plague in Europe during the 1300s, mid 1300s. Okay, let's let's continue. Okay, so we're. We're not, in other words, the microbes aren't in our world, we're in theirs. <laughs> we just happen to be one of the species. And they've had three and a half billion years uh, uh, running um, jump on us as far as evolution and how to work with other organisms and how to replicate themselves and stuff like that. And there's about 10 times as many as them, in fact, 10 times as many viruses and others as our stars in the universe, which is almost is really difficult. Now, by the way, we're doing this moon-based project, and does anyone, you might remember that when humans first went to the moon, that the first thing they did when they got back was be quarantined for three weeks. In fact, they went into this little uh, uh, sealed capsule, and then it got trucked off to the uh, mainland and such, uh, because they were concerned that there might be uh, organisms on the moon that could contaminate humans and of course no humans would have any defense against them at all particularly if they were foreign biology or something and so uh in fact i'm trying to remember how long they did that yeah uh how long they did that um but in any case so we're not concerned about um yes and 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 that's one of the things i'm going to take a look at that uh, black plague and what it did here as, as we compare pandemics, but okay, so we're no longer concerned about uh, living organisms that we might pick up on the moon, but one of the things that we learned be since then was essentially when you talk about any human being, we, we may be about a trillion human cells all trying to work together, sometimes not so well, and, but we have about 10 trillion microbes on and in us, which is a bizarre thing to think about. Okay, but what I want to leave from here is that most microbes are not disease producers. In other words, there's about a trillion species, only uh, 1,400 that create human disease. Of course, if you're the one that gets it, even viruses get diseased. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, rampant. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I found that. And so uh, obviously uh, any numbers that you have, or any numbers that you see and question, uh, let's go ahead and question them because I'd like to make sure that my information is correct. Yeah, we are. Uh, not only that, but I find it fascinating that our cells work together through hormones and uh, you know enzymes and whatever. Uh, but they don't necessarily have to. In other words, they they want to live. 
and sometimes they try to live beyond the time that they're supposed to die. Uh, plan, what is it, synapses? I was trying to remember um, for obsolescence. Um, uh, you know, uh, cancer cells, for example, just keep trying to live. Okay, so let's take a I'll say course of disease. Um, for a little bit of um, biology and immunology for um, people who might not be, who may not know that field very well, but essentially what happens is the vector, like a mosquito or whatever the mosquitoes or a tick or whatever is carrying, uh, that may be a virus, bacteria, a toxin, whatever, um, tries to get infection. Uh, depending on your genetics, your Im immunity against that particular bacteria, virus, etc., nutritional status, stress, pregnancy, underlying disease, which is what the comorbidity, you may or may not get infected. You may be able to block it first. Uh, like if I get a little cut, you know, I put uh, uh, some sort of thing like, oh, okay, there, I was looking for the actual term. Apoptosis, how do you pronounce that? Apoptosis, cell suicide, exactly. Okay, so you may get infected. So you get infected, and then it depends on the ability to cause disease once you're infected. Because disease is interfering with the functions of ap apoptosis. Apoptosis. Okay, so the disease is uh, is interfering with the functions of particular parts of your body. So just because you're infected may not mean that you get a disease. You may just have it, and it may be sitting. Halitosis. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, then it depends on uh, the virulence. For example, can anybody tell me one that's really, really virulent? It's like, like well, Black Plague, right? Okay, it killed between a third and a half of Mar ooh, Marburg's awful, or Ebola. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so it depends on, yeah, pneumonic plague, uh, for example. But, you know, if you were a little bug trying to replicate, killing off the host really quickly is not a great idea. What you want to do is you want to try to spread it. So you want to get people to uh, have diarrhea or cough or mucus all over the place or things like that. Uh, some... Bugs, of course, uh, and I'm just going to use the word bug, but some bugs uh, are very difficult to catch. Airborne ones are particularly nasty. Um, exactly. That, exactly. And, and, it, and, the, and the cold virus, which is the coronavirus, has been around for a long time, so it's kind of, uh, you know, they're not smart, but they're certainly the ones that survive, certainly have learned how to uh, replicate. Okay, so and so virulence has to do with is it going to kill you or not? Okay, so as a social phenomenon, we're looking at an incubation period. Now, for COVID, this was anywhere from three to fourteen days, depending on the variant. About three days for the latest Omicron variants, and it's the exposure to the first symptoms. So you could be exposed, and then it may take a while before you start having those types of symptoms. Oh, okay. Uh, and then and then you have this clinical illness where you have symptoms. But there is a latent period, which is between exposure and actually being infectious. So these are all terms having, and then infectious is when you can infect others. For COVID-19, it was a few days before the symptoms and up to perhaps 10 to 20 days after and you may even be symptomless and still be infectious. So this is not a presentation on immuno uh, infectious diseases, but I thought it was important to uh, put that out there first because if we're going to talk about a pandemic, we want to know, well, how does that work? Okay, this is really important too because you can't get a pandemic unless you can get it going all over the world. And so, how many people will one person infect? Um, if you look at the influenza, not coronavirus, but the influenza virus of 1918, 
it had about a 2.5% mortality rate, and one person was likely to infect two or three people. So it took a little while to get it going. But then again, we didn't have a lot that we could throw at this. COVID-19 is really weird. It has, it's about the same. Hi. So, uh, Ewing. Okay, so it's about the same, but there, uh, for example, as some of the variants got going, particularly Omicron, you're getting up to a uh, effective reproduction number of uh, nearly the same as like mumps and measles. In fact, it was a weird thing, but I don't know who, who's old enough to remember. You don't have to say, but who's old enough to remember when parent when parents used to bring their kids together so that everybody could get mumps and measles at the same time. They did in my, they did in my family, chicken pox, that sort of thing. Because it was so infectious. They are. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, but it was so infectious that they just absolutely, measles, probably, measles is bad stuff. It was better to have um, in, um, vaccination. Um, well, uh, yes, uh, I, I mentioned that, um, George, I mentioned that that was kind of a, I didn't mean to be flippant on that. It just sounded like a good word to use, but the, but the pandemic's still on. But something like Ebola or Marburg and stuff like that has, first of all, a very low rate of reproductive because, frankly, it kills off its host, which is not good. Okay, let's go on here again. I want to get to some other parts, but this is... Uh, I'm trying to cover all of... Yeah, it's kind of a dark sense of humor. Okay, so, exactly. I hope nobody's terribly offended by it. Um, uh, it has double entendre stuff. Okay, so anyway, um, I wanted to cover all the different parts of a pandemic. So, let's take a look at then... Okay, so that's diseases and how diseases get started and how they spread and infect infectivity and stuff. And so let's take a look then how this pandemic compares with pandemics in the past. We've already talked a little bit about them. For example, the uh, Black Plague in Europe killed off a lot of the population. It, it was particularly virulent. So, okay, I uh, here again, uh, Dr. Hendricks probably has more. Well, okay, hold on there, again. I'm going to talk about her herd immunity towards the end because there's really kind of a couple ways of achieving that and if you want to think about it the black plague since you brought it up the black plague uh, certainly produced herd immunity but it killed most of the people off now on the other hand it's not so very much with us because if you have any European background you're a survivor of the black plague and so, it, you know, the people that weren't are dead. And so um, that's one way to achieve, achieve herd immunity. But the same way with the 1918 influenza, it killed uh, 40 to 50 million people. And basically, uh, what, about a quarter of the people on Earth were infected. But that's not a good way to get her, herd immunity. There's a better way. And so I'll talk about that here in a second. Okay. So now HIV AIDS is still a pandemic. Um, it has been for 40 years and it's killed off 70 million people. No, excuse me, 70 million cases, 30 million deaths, but we've been able to figure out with a cocktail and stuff how to keep people from dying. But at the very beginning, it was fairly virulent. But the big one, it has been smallpox. Smallpox has been around since prehistory. And it was nearly totally eliminated in 1980. But it killed off hundreds of millions of people, uh, particularly during the 20th century, over the, the, its course. Now, COVID-19 has had a minimum. Uh, we were talking about uh, reporting and data. has had a minimum of about 670 million cases. That's what's been reported that John Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine put online but only 7 million deaths. And the reason for that is, uh, there's many reasons for that, and we'll take a look at that. In other words, more cases than almost any other, but that's also because we've got 8 billion 
Uh, well, it may very well. I'm taking these numbers off the John Hopkins site, which, which like I said, are probably minimums and conservatives. Like, for example, uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, there were certain numbers of, of cases in the United States, and then the people who actually knew better said, it's probably 10 times that. Yeah, that's the one I was uh, looking at. Uh, it, I believe that map says 7 million, but um, it probably was a lot more deaths and a lot more cases. I frankly think that perhaps it's the same way as the 1918 flu, that maybe a quarter or more of the people on Earth got it, not just 675 million. But we'll take a look at the actual data in a minute. I spent quite a bit of time analyzing the data myself. And so I'll show you what my findings are. Okay, so let's take a look then at a illustration of the pandemic timeline. Okay, now this slide actually comes, yeah, uh, and thank you for the, uh, thank you for that confirmation. That's kind of where I've got some of these numbers. If it is something different, I definitely want to change the slide. Okay, this slide actually comes, it's been adapted from the first presentation we gave back in April of 2020. At that time, we were concerned that there were 1 million cases worldwide, not 675 million. And that this and the, the World Health Organization had declared this as a pandemic. But you can see the course there is that it, is it actually they think it probably started somewhere in November uh, in China. And then by the end of 2019, which is why it's called COVID. 19 is that the Chinese alerted the World Health Organization because there was a cluster of unusual pneumonia cases and then they found that this is something novel and th then you started getting cases outside and deaths and it just went downhill from there or uphill depending on whether you're looking at the graph or not. Okay, so now this is an interesting graph. This is again from most of the data here comes from the John Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine site. This is the timeline up till now of the pandemic from a worldwide standpoint. Now, as I mentioned, I put a lot of information into these slides. So let me just point out a few things. One is the little white uh, box there over on the right is the, the waves of um, the 1918 uh, pandemic. By the way, let me go back here because a lot of people like to, let me go back to one of the other slides. This one, not this one. This one. This one there with the thing. Why is it called, the 1918 was sometimes called the Spanish flu. And I have a purpose for asking this question. Does anybody know why it was sometimes referred to as the Spanish flu? In fact, it's referred to as the Spanish flu. Well, that's an interesting point. Is that actually during World War, during close, uh, during World War One, the journalists agreed. Because can you imagine journalists agreeing to anything right now, uh, particularly from uh, government and stuff? But the journalists agreed that in World War One, they didn't want to concern people with what was going on at the trenches. You know, there wasn't like. Uh, video that you could take right now or whatever. In other words, the information could be filtered a little bit. Uh, well, now, Mike, that's exactly correct, and that's why I wanted to do this. It wasn't the Spanish flu. The, uh, what, what was happening was it was basically in the places where U.S. soldiers were, and since Spain was neutral and they had cases, they could report, well, that, and you're right, that's kind of what it really should be called, is, um, so they had cases going on in Spain, and so they could record what's going on in Spain, because Spain was neutral, it wasn't at the front, and so it was sometimes reported as the Spanish flu. So it was a little bit of propaganda, you want to say, but the idea is, is these little viruses and bacteria really don't care where you come from. Uh, it's not the U.S. flu, it's not the French flu, it's not the Chinese flu, it's not, it's, it's, it's a pandemic that 
goes around the world. It just happened to start with U.S. soldiers, in and the U.S. soldiers then went over to Europe and spread it. Um, and that's kind of how it got going, the 1918 one. That's why you have, and then they came back and spread it in the, in the U.S., and so that's why you got that huge spike uh, in 1918. And then, of course, during the winter, it is a flu, and so it caused more deaths, 1919, and then again. So it actually lasted for a few years also. So I wanted to throw in that. But if you look, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if you look at, at, at the, like I said, there's a lot of data here. If you look at this one slide, you'll see that uh, there are ways to begin with. And then the very first uh, cases hit the most vulnerable people. So you, you can see that where it says, A, there weren't a lot of cases worldwide, but there were a strong spike in deaths because uh, people uh, that were most vulnerable were dying of this. And then you had the variants come along. And the ones that were most virulent, or that spread the most, were like Alpha, Delta, Omicron, I'll talk about that. Um, okay, and tagline, that's good to know. In other words, I like to have that kind of information. I can look at it on the Zoom video and stuff, uh, because I, I want to know. The reason I did this, these presentations is, A, I love to do research, and B, I like to share it with you, because I get real information from you. So I always learn something during these uh, presentations. So I appreciate uh, comments. Okay, so you had a lot of deaths worldwide during the uh, first variants, uh, where you got Alpha and Del Delta, which is the B to C area. And then Omicron came along, and it really changed things, because anyone that had not gotten it got it. That's why I'm saying it probably went just about everywhere body in the world probably got exposed to this thing just you may not have got symptoms so it's difficult to say there's a case of something where people didn't get symptoms and then of course the vaccinations came along with more immunity and so you've got it somewhat petering out but i said it but like i said it's definitely not gone okay so in the first months of her attack <laughs> uh weaponize your house okay uh, yeah, okay, so in the first months of the pandemic, people got the idea that this was kind of an old person's disease. In other words, okay, great, let's shut up the old, old uh, people and go about business as usual. And so because in the very first months, you had basically most cases were of people 60 and older, and... Uh, then some people got uh, uh, severe and then critical and didn't die. But this is not the case. Now this is, I, li I like these graphs. This is a graph actually here where I am in Texas in the U.S. But three years later, 75% of the cases were among younger people, not the elderly. But 75% of the deaths were among older people. Whereas the 1918, remember, it's a, in, the 1918 was an influenza virus. This is a highly mutated coronavirus. But the influenza one attacked mainly people of soldier age, college age, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, but so the big thing is this is not a old person's disease. Okay, in the first months of the pandemic, you can see the nations who, the, who, that are trying to get a grip on this. Um, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, which all um, are places that can be isolated pretty easily, either islands or peninsulas. Yeah, and then, uh, <laughs> okay, and then you'll notice on the, on the left there, you'll see that mainland China through a number of measures, which I'll talk about here in a minute, um, and South Korea, both kind of got a grip on the pandemic, and other nations didn't. So by the time you had mid-March, you've got a pandemic. Okay, let's talk then about 
that's kind of the rough timeline. Let's talk a, a little bit about the variants. Here's some of the first mutations in the first half a year of the or less of the uh, pandemic. And so you've got some of these mutations, or excuse me, some of these mutations which, because of their nature, what the mutation was of, you had what they call viruses of concern or viruses of interest. The viruses of concern, particularly the alpha and delta, which you'll notice on the graph were the ones that caused the most deaths per, per you know, uh, number of cases, um, were the ones they were, they were watching. Now, over time here, there were a lot more mutations. You'll see up in the upper thing, the ones that are in red are the ones that they were concerned about, VOC on them, but there were a lot of other mutations. And then, of course, Omicron came along. And Omicron had mutations of the spike proteins, which are what helped the virus to... Now, uh, Dr. Hendricks helped me out here, but the spike proteins, that is that the one that helps them glom on or to get in or to replicate or to uh, whatever? But the idea is that the Omicron one was way uh, more infectious, even if it might be less lethal. And so they knew a lot about these mutations, but they can't, you know, they can't say wear your mask, etc., uh, or any other measure. Make you feel blue. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Health affairs of too many arcane. Yeah, uh, we need to have them named after movie stars or something. So we, <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> something that people would remember and, and be able to say. But I now, I'm, I'm not picking on the Netherlands, but I love the graph here. This is the best graph I found. But if you look at the worldwide timeline, you've got worldwide up there, where you've got the original mutation that affected humans. You've got Alpha, Delta, Omicron, etc. and stuff. But if you look at uh, Netherlands, a lot of people kept track of what... Uh, what variant people had, and so you can see the ones which are most um, infectious going through a population. So at the very beginning in the Netherlands, you had the first mutation after the original one, the alpha, and you can also see that there are a lot of deaths, both from the original, or at least per case. In other words, they had very few cases, but you have the, a spike of deaths with the original one that infected humans, you've got alpha, uh, which uh, then caused death, then, then delta came along, and then Omicron. And everywhere was a huge spike of cases um, uh, of uh, the Omicron one. And there's lots and lots of variants. So I would imagine right now, everybody who, if they have it or got it recently. Okay, and there, there you go. So February 20th, is just about the right, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, the tagline, please. Yeah, go ahead. And, okay, so then let's talk about because this is the one I wanted to talk about the most here was behavior. A lot of this is my own, um, which if you're still recovering, a lot of times that is called long COVID. My, I actually. I'm almost positive I got the Omicron variant in mid-February this year. And it was different than anything else I've ever gotten. Uh, I still have symptoms from it. And uh, they're, they're resolving. But I have a feeling it's like, you know, hiding in some closet in the back. In, yeah. Well, I went all this time without getting it. And then I did what I told the doctor to say I actually had to cough just then, is I told the doctor that I committed sev uh, several poten potentially deadly sins, uh, which is uh, I went, I had a big Thanksgiving with family and Christmas with family that we sponsored, and then I went to my granddaughter's wedding, and I saw a movie during the week, I mean, I was trying not to, and then, uh, you know, ate out, and, you know, all of these sorts of 
things that could easily have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, oh yeah, and then uh, yeah, the river Viking thing. I went on the, a uh, Viking river boat. I was over in Europe for three weeks, so you know, if there's any way to catch it, I would have got it, which I did. Um, exactly, Avatar two. That's how I got it. Uh, from probably from the Avatar movie. Okay, well, whatever. So, um, luckily, I'm I'm getting over it, but I, it was worse than anything I've had in a long time. I didn't like it, uh, but it only lasted about a week, and now I'm just getting over it. Okay, so let's take a look pandemic behavior. Let's take a look at um, individual, community, national, and then regional behavior. And if you learn nothing, take a look. Well, and Delia, you know, everybody should still be doing that. And I do that in a lot of places. Uh, but while well, I do that in a lot of places, it's just sometimes I have not. And all it takes is one time, you know. Uh, okay, so let's take a look then at individual behavior. If you, if you get nothing out of this presentation, I'd like you to take a look at some of the stuff I'm doing right now. So pandemic. So first of all, from an individual standpoint, a pandemic, there's a lot that goes into it. One is kind of, okay, bubonic plague and smallpox, you could tell people that were infected. And, well, was it Norway or Sweden? I thought it was Sweden that did that. Uh, Sweden, yes. Okay, so uh, I had hoped that perhaps maybe this pandemic, you know, if COVID-19 would turn your skin green or something, um, then we would have all known who was infected. But it didn't. And, and it didn't create, in other words, from an outside standpoint, other than coughing and sneezing and stuff, uh, it didn't create the types of symptoms that people would have. In other words, without seeing, it's hard to believe for some people. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, I still have, uh, I mean, we can compare symptoms, but I still got post-nasal drip. I've still got a several other things, which I never have had in my in my life. Uh, kind of, you know, morning cough, tiredness, all of that stuff. Okay, so individual. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't know. You know, my brain, same thing. Uh, so there's also needs for versus wants. In other words, you need to go to work to pay for things. Most people live on the edge and they can't be just shut up in the house for a month. Your children, your relatives need to go to school and you can go to the store, um, all of that stuff like that. Now, on the other hand, in like in my case, my granddaughter was getting married. The holidays were there. Uh, some people get depressed uh, if they don't go out. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. So those are kind of needs versus wants. Then, it, then there's the idea of, well, who do you believe? Do you believe disease authorities? Or do you believe your family or friends who kind of heard that this is going on? Or your or politicians or clergies? Um, you know, all of that. And then for some people, they find the whole thing very complicated and stuff. But frankly, and I'm going to go to the next slide, is it's not that complicated, okay? The idea is, one... Uh, to the left is a bulletin put out in 1918 by the New York Department of Health. And it basically said, okay, there's a new disease. Keep out of crowds. Um, it spreads mainly from inhaling. Cover up uh, coughs and sneezes. Wash your face, hands, avoid gathering. Have you heard this? I mean, that was back 100 years ago. Uh, so the main thing, and this may save your life, people, so you know, take a look at this, is the main thing is you have an immune system and you want to increase your defenses. So the analogy there is instead of just a gate, or instead of just a low fence, you want to have a castle. So you stay as healthy as you can through good nutrition, sleep, and, and good practices, uh, masks and stuff, um, and then you get vaccinated uh, because vaccinations have proven to work for the past 200 years. Um, 
Yes, they do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as I get toward the end of, of the presentation. And then the other thing is give your immune system a chance. In other words, limit your exposure. How many people are storming the gates? And that's really the bottom line. How many little viruses are storming your immune system? So you stay away from where the virus is concentrated. That's easy. <clears throat> you wash your hands, sanitize exposed services, wear a mask. Particularly if it's airborne, that doesn't do any good if it's not. Um, except for, you know, touching your face. Okay, let's take a look then at community behavior. Um, yes, that, that cytokine storm is actually what killed most people in 1918 from what I, my understanding. In other words, they had superb, you know, young people, superb immune systems, and they overreacted, and you, and you got that thing that was able to kill them. Um, so for them, the idea is to not be exposed. Of course, if you're a soldier in the trenches, that's kind of hard to do. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I, I was just mentioning is it was the young people who tended. That was the graph. Okay, so for, from a community concept, it only takes one. And I've got a little quote there from, and I need to cough again. Hang on a second. Okay, back. Um, I took, a, I took a, a time to put a little Star Trek thing in there. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few are the one. So if you care about family, friends, yeah, others and stuff, don't be the one in that graph there to infect everybody else. It, we're, it, we're basically our own worst enemy. Now, here's where I talk about herd immunity. First of all, one of the things you're trying to do if you want to limit deaths is to do what's called flatten the curve. In other words, you don't want to get so many people sick that it overwhelms the health system, including workers who also die of the because they're not immune. And we had quite a few people that were health workers at the very beginning die. So you want to sp spread out the number of cases and deaths so that it allows the healthcare system to treat the sick so you don't have quite as many deaths. It's not like the Black Plague, which it could very well be if you just did nothing. Okay, so, uh, and it was virulent enough. Okay, so now herd immunity, you can get it two different ways. Herd immunity means that you have a high enough percentage of immune people so that the virus, you know, tries to attack one person and then another and another, and it just doesn't spread very rapidly because it hits people who are immune. And so there's two options for doing that. Option one is you just let this thing run. You just let it spread. Well, that's 1918, and that's the Black Plague. You're going to get the maximum number of deaths that way. Uh, because the issue is the more people that are infected, the other way is it's not just the initial mutation. The number of people, that are, the more people that are infected, the more mutations. The more little viruses out there and the more chance to mutate and then it potentially more deaths because you don't know whether the next mutation is going to be more effective, uh, more lethal. Um, if it's more lethal, we're really in trouble. So the best option is to achieve immunity by vaccination because that first of all uh, gets the herd immunity that you want, but in a controlled way. In other words, you're not just gambling on whether your immune system is uh, strong enough uh, for you to live and not die. But uh, otherwise, you're just, uh, you know, throwing the people with low immune systems to the wall, so to speak. Okay, enough preaching. Okay, pandemic behavior. Let's take a look then at national. Uh, this is, a lot of this part is my own research using the uh, data that I could get. First of all, um, National strategies. In some countries, there was really tight control. I mean, quarantining cities, mandatory masks. And then in other cases, like you brought up Sweden, yeah, you don't want to have all the mutations because you don't know how they're going to react. That, that's like spinning the, the you know, uh, uh, gambling wheel and uh, hoping that the next one's better. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense because mutations uh, try, you know, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. In the case of Omicron, you ended up with one that was way more infectious um, than the ones before. 
Okay. And and death is not the only result of this stuff. It's it's loss of productivity. It's uh, infecting people who do have immune system uh, that are not as strong like older people and family and friends, and, you know, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay. There are also nations that simply had no controls. In other words, they just counted on people to do the right thing, which didn't work <laughs> well in a lot of cases. Unless you were in, in more of a collective versus individual, bit individualist type place where people looked after others before their own health. In other words, wearing a mask for a month was the price you took to not infect a whole bunch of people. Okay, or limited control. In other words, one moment they go, oh my goodness, we're going to you know, have mandatory masks. And then everybody protests and then... They go, okay, no, it's lifted. We've got to get back our economy. In other words, seesawing back and forth. No wonder people were confused. Or you leave it up to regions. You go, in the case of the United States, you go, well, I guess it's up to each state as to determine what should happen. Well, that's nice if states can hold off the border, but, <laughs> you know, or an EU, <clears throat> each country going, well, we have our own little rules here. Nobody, you know, hopefully nobody will get infected throughout the, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Okay, so the healthcare systems, they can either be highly prepared, you know, well staffed, well prepared, uh, plenty of vaccines, free testing, all that stuff, or totally unprepared, which in underdeveloped countries, that's often the case where they're underfunded, few vaccines, or they didn't get vaccines until year three, uh, poorly equipped, etc. Um, I also mentioned the who do you believe, because this is at a national level, and environmental differences. Now, that can be positive or negative. In the developed world, people live a lot of times in artificial environments. And they don't go out into that, you know, icky garden or, or play with dirt. Uh, one of the reasons I think I have a good immune system for, you know, someone in their 70s is because I played in the dirt and I played outside. Yeah, <laughs> I played outside and in the dirt this morning. I was kneeling in the dirt, uh, planting a, a bush, and I think, and I've been doing that, you know, my whole life, and going out hiking and doing stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think I've got because I haven't just lived in a uh, air conditioned uh, house. Um, and but if you also have older populations, like in, in developed world, oh, I forgot to throw a, a slide in there. Um, about a, a population pyramid, but and that's a long one that I need to read. But uh, somebody read it. <laughs> okay, so and we're not used to uh, new diseases. We're in the developing world. People live. I'm, I'm really generalizing. People live closer to uh, na nature. Uh, there's diseases common. Uh, it's younger populations. In in a lot of places in developing countries, you might have. 50% of the population under 16 or under 20, yeah. Um, immune, and, and so their immune systems have seen a lot of stuff. Uh, so they're basically prepared for some new virus to come along because, frankly, they, they, they've seen it before, the immune system. Okay. So let's take a look then at regional. Like I said, this part is the one where I did the... Um, well, I haven't got to grasp it. Okay. Regional things, basically, like I said, collective versus individuality. Collective is basically you're thinking of your community or family above yourself, whereas individual, the U.S. happens to be the most individualist nation on earth, is um, the, uh, a lot of people will think, well, you know, everybody for themselves, survival of the fittest, uh, or in some cases, you know, God will protect me. Uh, I deserve to be, you know, whatever you, you want to put out there, but they, a lot of people don't look at community or family or whatever quite as much as, um, well, there you go, tagline. That's exactly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in other words, getting away from nature can be <laughs> lethal. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, urban versus rural. There's a lot of countries and regions that are naturally isolated from each other because they're fairly, uh, the cities are fairly wide apart. The, the um, never even had cowpox, uh, although cowpox might have helped you. <laughs> okay, uh, and then border control. 
And so, in other words, there's a lot that goes into this uh, type of thing. Now, let me show you what, before I run out of time, let me show you some of the stuff I did. Same thing with a pet, all my life, that sort of thing. Uh, even today, I've got eight chickens and two dogs, and I play in the yard. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the early months. These are the countries that got, and I found a, in fact, I said, you know, that looks a lot like the major um, tra uh, air traffic routes in the world. And lo and behold, I found an article that had a, um, really? Okay, yeah, there you go, cross, cross immunity. So I had a, I found an article that said, you know, the, uh, the cases, the first cases of SARS, um, COVID-2, which is the name of the virus, which became the COVID-19 disease, uh, cow, yeah. The Vosh, absolutely, okay. So uh, looked a lot like the air traffic route. So this was the route. Now, this next slide is supposed to scare you. This is what we ended up with. In the early months of 2003, the ones in orange, by the way, are the ones that still have the most active cases right now, which are, you can see that's distributed around the world. These are the total number of cases that... Um, people had, and like, like other people have mentioned, these are like the minimums. And I don't, like I said, I don't want to be flippant about this, because these are, numbers are so impersonal. But every single one of these numbers, these hundreds of millions or tens of millions, is a person. Every case, every death affects a uh, lot. We have cows behind us. Our dogs love to bark with cows, too. Um, every case, every death affects many more people than just the 670 676 million people, and I suspect that's a low number. In other words, I would say it's actually probably in the billions. Okay, now this is new. You're not going to find this anywhere because this is what I. This is the data I pulled out of the John Hopkins thing. What I did was I took regions, and the regions can possibly have a genetic similarities, but on the other hand. It may be because they cross borders. So here's East Asia. Now, East Asia, first of all, a lot of the cultures here are collective cultures with strong government action that mostly contained the pandemic until Omicron. Omicron, of course, then everybody got it. Um, you can see in some nations like Mongolia that uh, vaccinations weren't quite as um, available. You can also see that Mongolia is kind of an outlier as far as these other nations. Because most of these nations there were able to hold off until Omicron. And the one of the things is if you look at Japan, unfortunately, Japan was able to hold off until Omicron. And now it had, it's experiencing the most cases and the most deaths than during the entire uh, pandemic. Um, and then Mongolia actually looks a lot like one of the nations to the west of there rather than East Asia uh, being inland. So let's take a look at some of these other ones. This is Australia. What, what, uh, and I looked it up. Australasia actually is a term for this area with Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea has a little different profile. It looks a lot more like the nations to the north of it. I do. I have a slide for Cuba. I have a slide. I did 70 countries. Uh, not only the uh, profiles, but also a measure of, and in the blue box, what I did was basically I divided number of reported cases divided by population of the country. And then the incidence of death, I did total deaths per thousand cases. And that's the numbers you see. The ones which are in orange, for example, Papua New Guinea. Um, they only reported less than a percent of their population getting it, but you'll see that the death rate's higher by about 10 than the other nations, and that's probably because what you're looking at is, is something that's underreported. Um, there's quite a few nations that are like that, and you'll see a, a graph here at the end 
that shows that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, hotspots pretty much overlapping, etc. And then there's the world to reference it, the little one on the world. So the, my interpretation of this area was that these are island nations, or so they could actually contain it a bit, or the government there was government action that mostly contains the pandemic until Omicron. So you had fewer. It was less deadly overall. Okay, let's take a look at Oceania. These aren't really are the island nations. You'll see that there are, there was almost no cases. By the way, the, the little yellow star is where Omicron comes in. And you'll see in places like Samoa or Micronesia. First of all, Micronesia had almost no vaccines available to them, uh, but they were able to hold off until Omicron. Fiji was a little different. Fiji looks a little bit more like... Uh, the countries near it, like Papua New Guinea and stuff, where you had most cases and deaths in Delta. And by the time Omicron came off, basically, <clears throat> by the time Omicron came around, there was basically nobody left to infect it, already didn't have it. Um, so this is, but if you look at the thing, it, it, it's very complicated. So basically, island nations mostly were able to contain the pandemic despite less vaccine until Omicron. Okay, let's keep going. Somebody asked about Cuba, other places. This is Southeast Asia. If you look at this, where you kind of go down the peninsula from uh, Bourbon or Myanmar to Thailand and Malaysia, you've got a very, very similar pattern here, except for Malaysia, where Thailand and Myanmar either underreported or that it was difficult to uh, move around the country, uh, jungles, uh, transportation, whatever, because it, it, or they were immune. I mean, there's so many different ways of, of, a, of uh, looking at this data, but basically they all look the same is what I'm getting at. In other words, that's not a coincidence. Now you look at the other countries here and you've got Cambodia, and in case Laos and Vietnam, all looking the same as like Thailand and Burma and Malaysia. Um, Philippines looks very different, possibly because there was more exposure to the outside. It's got a different type of prof profile. Singapore was one of the countries that did better than almost any other country on Earth to contain the number. In other words, 0.40 4 means that either... 40% of the country got was, got it, or some people got more than one case of it. So 0.4 is an indicator of the number of cases per population. Well, you know, tagline, that's exactly, there were a lot of countries, I mean, I'm coming up on the hour, and I'm going to go over probably about, about 10 minutes, if you can hang around, because uh, I've got a summary at the end here, and I want to go through some of these ones. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of information. And I don't want to just breeze through it. Um, but, in the, but think of it. From a political standpoint, there's several reasons why you might have underreporting. One is, like Kazakhstan at one time said, or Kazakhstan, I think it was, basically said, COVID, what COVID? I don't want you to hear that word. I don't want you to report it. There is nothing. We've got everything under control, at least for a while. Yeah, I understand, says Ajit. That's... Um, yeah, very unpleasant me. Okay, but I appreciate you can. In other words, don't. Uh, I try to keep this to an hour. If you need to go, uh, no problem. I'm going to try to make this. Uh, there is a display uh, within walking distance of the amphitheater, and it's about three years old now. But I'm going to take this information and I'm going to have it over there, including the slide. So if you you're not going to miss anything if you are interested. In so notice, and Singapore uh, did a good job. You can notice the green there. As far as the number of, they had a lot of cases, but very little deaths because they uh, did a good job. Okay, here's South Asia. So um, except for Pakistan, which seemed to get hit at every possible time, uh, both the original and Alpha and Delta and, and Omicron, uh, you've got a lot of people where Delta was the biggie. In other words, more cases of death before Omicron. And then 
data interpretation. I, I think this is important too. There's a lot of ways to interpret. I was going, how do you interpret this? Okay, you can either have, I'm, it, it could either be, in other words, why are there low cases but high percentage of death for cases? Well, one is underreported cases. In other words, if you're symptomless or not a lot, you don't go to the hospital, you might not get reported. Mostly immune populations, like I was mentioning, in developing countries. Mostly young population. Uh, mostly only cases leading to death. So those are the only ones that are reported. <clears throat> and then you have to look at some of the other nation, uh, regions. Okay, here's the other region. There aren't that many. We're, we're almost to the end here, so hang loose. Um, well, there, there, there is numerical evidence of underreports, and, and statistical methods can do that. This is a very rough idea of saying, well, you ought to look at underreporting. Um, okay, up till now, there weren't a lot of early deaths, but now as you go further this west, you're going to see that, that uh, there are a lot of cases, a lot of deaths at the very beginning. Uh, thank you, Syzygy. Um, so you'll see in here that, first of all, nations in, in Western Asia, or, or if you want to call it Mideast, uh, which is a little bit of a Eurocentric way of looking at it, um, it likely reflects the complex policies and connections that these nations have. So you want to take, try to take a look at South Asia to see the differences. Okay, so here's now Africa. We're coming on now. Africa is huge. So I divided it up into different uh, sections, North Africa, West Africa. Now, if you look at this, you've got particularly the ones in the wet, in the, uh, that you've got some people that have early cases, and then you've got multiple waves, um, and a lot of un, what I would call underreporting <coughs> going on here. Let's go on and take a look at uh, Central, Southeastern Africa. Look at those, almost, uh, if you look at those, you know, wave, 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 and they look very similar to each other. You can tell that there's a lot of probably travel uh, going on between countries um, in order to get that kind of stuff. A lot of underreporting, in other words, uh, or high immunization going on, but, um, and then only the people who were really sick got it. Okay, South, e South Europe and Southeast Europe, a lot of early reports. Well, yes, and if I had a lot of time, the reason why I took time to do this is because I wanted to do some raw analysis. And then you could get, what I'd love to do would be to, to correlate this with age. In other words, if you look at the population graphs, which nations had really young people, which had uh, a lot of old people, um, transportation, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways you could look at this. Uh, uh, statistical causes of death. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which you could find some really cool patterns, I think, by looking at this. But you'll see in, in here, in South Asia, where Spain and Italy, of course, were hit hardest, or, or some of the hardest hit nations. And then you can see what happened after that, where Delta and the Nomicon, uh, where Greece and Turkey and stuff. And so some of the, these patterns are very interesting. Here's Eastern Europe. A lot of them look, well, <laughs> that's why this is not, in other words, the explanations are not simple. Uh, and that's culture. Um, the explanations are not simple, so how do you filter out a particular factor? Well, you can't. So you'd have to do some, as somebody mentioned in, I think, the last presentation, you'd have to do a lot of multivariable uh, analysis. In other words, advanced statistical methods to uh, uh, see which ones actually um, are factors and which ones are just, um, uh, what's the word for um, a variable that is just confusing? Co-founding variable? Um, confounding variable? Not co-founding, variable. Okay, yeah, confounding variable. Okay, so on here, you can see Eastern Europe the uh, some of the same patterns over and over again. Um, but what I'm getting at is on these patterns, 
is it's probably not a coincidence that countries with these neighbors have the same sort of patterns in this pandemic, which is the reason why it was a pandemic. In other words, there's a lot of it, the, the borders are porous. You've got people, you've got people in France and different borders and stuff. Uh, Northern Europe here uh, also vary. Now, Sweden, you'll notice over there on Sweden is that up at the top left, 